just a question before we start what uh so when was your first tour of northern ireland 1984 85 okay so i was at that on you when you went in 84 i was three years old so before to get into the military side of things right what what are your secrets to aging well because you look <laughs> <laughs> oh why do i look older mate <laughs> oh mate i think First it's just <laughs> Joking. You don't have to answer it. Well yeah, done, though. Like, yeah. Well done. Thank you, mate. Weird. I think it's the um, not a wrinkle in sight. Oh, mate. I think it's the fizz. <laughs> anyway, and no, those, in all seriousness, mate. Drugs. Andy, absolute pleasure. Thank you. For, thank you for giving me the time. I know you're a busy man. Welcome, mate. Um, yeah. That, I mean, we had the conversation before when we had a meeting with me, me and Paul, and we were talking about um, uh, military backgrounds and stuff. Mm. And you mentioned um, at the time. Your Northern Ireland experience mm. back in the eighties, he just said. So my experience is my first tour. I use that, those, that term loosely at the time was in two thousand and one of Northern Ireland. Mm. Yeah, two thousand and one and two thousand and one, which is obviously very different to your experience in, in the time you went. I've never had a chance to talk in depth to people who served before in the nineties and on the eighties and before. So if you're happy, mate. Describe it. I mean, you, you start what you want, pre-deployment training, uh, situate, whatever you want, whatever yeah. you want, however you want to go about yeah. it. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, I joined uh, the Royal Green Jackets in 1983, did my training um, at Peninsula Barracks, which um, has now been redeveloped, as I guess, uh, you know, a lot of barracks probably, have, or training establishments have been. Uh, it's now a really quite exclusive housing complex. Um, the museum, what is now the Rifles Museum, is is still there. And uh, when I finished training, uh, went to Third Battalion, the Royal Green Jackets, who at the time were based in Cella, um, in Germany. The, Cella, in Germany. Germany. Yeah. I'm going to move this, mate. So put it there. So when you're talking, Again, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So um, we're based in in Cella in in northern Germany, mechanized battalion. So essentially. Um, yeah, we had the FE-432 armoured personnel carrier, unless you're in recce, they get the scimitars. Um, so, yeah, I started, went to, I think my first, um, like, training was, was really in Medicine Man, like in Canada. So we went out there for a few months as a battle group, did some training. Medicine Man? But yeah, it was called, um, I, I think the, it's actually called something else now, but at the time it was called um, Exercise Medicine Man. So it's essentially Battus, the British Army training unit in Suffield. So you go over there, essentially it's fully equipped, all the armoured vehicles, like Chieftains, Challengers, um, and essentially you just do battle group exercises on the planes. Try not to get bitten by rattlesnakes. Um, I never went. I never went to Bath. Yeah, no, I never went yeah. out there, so no, no experience. It. Yeah. Oh, awesome. So that's cool. Um, came back, and then you know we were basically warned off on a, a tour for Belfast, for West Belfast. Um, so yeah, we went and did our pre-deployment training um, at Senalaga. So I think it was called Tin City. Um, and again, you know, you're, you're doing all your your kind of build-up training there with the with the Northern Ireland training team, as it was at the time. Um, and I think we probably had a bit of leave and then, you know, next thing we were flying over, landing in Aldergrove and then basically to our, our company or platoon locations. What was the situation at that time? Can you remember? Yeah, I mean, it was, um, you know, and I think I talked to you about this, you know, previously, but, um, you know, I was 19. Um, yeah, I, I would say I was pretty nervous about it. I mean, um, so in July uh, 1982, the provisional IRA uh, essentially exploded a, an IED at the bandstand in Regent's Park. We talked about this, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so seven bandsmen were killed in I London. Mean, yeah, in London. Yeah. So they were just putting on a, you know, a concert basically for you know for the public during the day, um, and then uh, I think two RGJ were in uh, West Belfast in in eighty two, um, and at the back of Springfield Road Police Station which is kind of off the Falls Road. It's an IUC station. Um, they came out of the back gates um, in an armoured land, in, sorry, in an armoured landy, um, turned into Crocus Street, which is the street that runs along the back. And um, the provisional IRA had taken over a house and opened fire with an M60, which it, they'd somehow procured, you know, for that particular shoot. 
Um, so two riflemen were were killed instantly. Another one died in hospital afterwards. So you know you've kind of got that going through your mind that the IRA has the capability to very easily, you know, put on that kind of shoot or ambush. Um, so I remember being pretty nervous, and then you know, essentially you get to your location, um, and that's where you're going to spend the next four and a half months. Um, and essentially, it's just a, a sequence then, you know, of uh, of basically mobile patrols, foot patrols, um, and stagging on in the various sangers. Um, and, you know, we might go to different locations. So like North Howard Street, might go up to Fort White Rock, uh, Grosvenor Road Police Station, Springfield Road Police Station. But essentially, what we were really doing is in support of the RUC. So, you know, whenever you're out on the ground, if you're doing a mobile patrol, you're going to be out, you know, two mili- two army Land Rovers with one RUC Hotspur, which are their kind of armoured Land Rovers. If you're on the ground, you know, you're going to have um, various multiples on the ground, like in bricks of, of four, um, but typically like the, you know, the platoon commander or the platoon sergeant will be with the RUC officer. So the tasks were led by the RUC or were they decided together with the military and the RUC liaison? And- uh, I guess, you know, they, they it was a combination. I guess, you know, the um, we we get our kind of, you know, patrol tasking um, and that might change dependent <laughs> if there was a threat um, or, a you know, specific threat, you a, a yeah. specific threat. Um, or sometimes it may be that we got a brief that, you know, there was an SF operation or something going on, or it might be special branch. So, you know, at times that would change, just depending on what was what was happening on the ground. I think one of the hardest things to deal with is that before you go, you've got a list of players, so essentially known terrorists. And not only do you know who they are, because... You, you're obviously looking at their photos you also know what they've done so you could be walking down the falls road and you could bump into essentially a para terrorist who you know has murdered but obviously not been prosecuted or found guilty a british soldier or a policeman or um you know and you you just have to go with that and that that that's pretty hard because it's you know, there's a level of aggression as a as a soldier, um, but you need to temper that. And you know, it's the fact that you know that, that these people have have committed offences, have killed, you know, um, policemen or or other soldiers. Yet yeah, you just have to you have to deal with that. And the reasons for not lifting them would be for various, right? I mean, keep them on the ground because because monitoring them and 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 gaining more in, intelligence from them through their networks. Yeah, and yeah. I guess the thing is, you know what. I realised very quickly is, you know, th- the end of the day, you've you've got to play by letter of the law. You know, yeah, of course you've got like your, you know, you've got your yellow card, but you realise the only way you're actually going to get to prosecute somebody is if one, you know, they're kind of caught in the act, or you can get enough evidence to, you know, essentially to to nail a prosecution. Um, that's the only way. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and it's one of the, like you said, it's one of the frustrating things. I remember reading, I remember reading the, uh, it was the report on, what was the investigation at the Bloody Sunday? What was it called? The, the, uh, oh, you've got it now. I can't oh, remember God, the, uh, the name of it. That's anyway, annoying, that, isn't it? That most recent Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was reading that, because I had not, I'd not really made any attempt to read any of it, apart from, I, I was making a mistake. I looked at everything in the papers and blah, 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 blah. I remember reading in that one of the things was one of the bits of information that came out was on, on Bloody Sunday, was that it there it was known that there it's it's known now, and it was must have been known at the time otherwise they wouldn't have the information the report that there was people on the ground and there was there was there was armed terrorists on the ground that day Martin McGuinness being one of them yeah you know armed known to be on the ground armed um yeah. in the vicinity and stuff had been planned and they'd been shot and there had been shots fired yeah. And you think, oh, man, I mean, blood, bloody Sunday aside and all that back and forth, right? Um, that aside, you think, and he was never lifted. Even back then, 72. Yeah. Was it 72 yeah. bloody Sunday, yeah? Yeah. And never lifted. Yeah. You know, how many, and, how many, and then as time goes on, how many people who have killed, injured, I'm talking about, you know, uh, terrorists now, and just, you know, 
walking scot free, and they can't be the nicest people on the planet. I'd say <laughs> some no, may have reformed, no. some <laughs> yeah, may have reformed. Yeah. very frustrating. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, you know, I think you know when I I've, I've read obviously some of the you know the, the the report and the press articles on Bloody Sunday, and you know the fact that you know the, the still trying to drive prosecution of service people, you know, from the seventies who are now, you know, essentially well retired and kind of into old age. And it's like, you know, I've always had this feeling and I guess, you know, I've, I've not been to Iraq or Afghanistan, but, you know, I guess it's the same thing, right? You're, you're maybe judged by people that have never been on the ground and never been in that situation. Um, you know, I remember we had, we probably hadn't been on the ground for very long on that particular tour and one of our guys shot a joyrider now at the end of the day he was with the RUC he had to make a decision whether it was right or wrong you know and he I'm sure would argue that there was a risk to life and limb you know the way the car was was being driven towards the security forces so he opened fire guy didn't wasn't killed thankfully but you know he received a gunshot wound and um you know, I, I know that the, you know, the kind of investigation was ongoing for a number of years. So they're the decisions, I guess, you have to, you have to make yeah, you know, in that a, moment. There was a similar episode with, with um, I think, I think it was three part at the time. Similar episode with a three part guy. Yeah. Uh, I think it was, li- I think it was late, mid to late nineties. And uh, a vehicle was, was rushing at a checkpoint. I'm not going to say a name. Just yeah, yeah, it's I, fine. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure he's still serving. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure he was serving when I was serving. And uh, um, as I recall, Joyrider wasn't was a checkpoint, but again, let's I'll rephrase that. There was a vehicle coming at a checkpoint, very similar modus operandi to um, a vehicle born IED, uh, you know, at the time. And uh, you might make, make a decision. And the only thing that makes that decision right or wrong is who happens to be in the vehicle and what their motives are. Yeah. Because the pattern up to that point is the same as a terrorist. What yeah. what do you do? You know, yeah. and similar things have happened in Afghanistan, similar things happen in Iraq, and similar things happen in other places. Um the information you presented with at the time of an incident, uh, at the time of something, if it all leads to this is a threat and the only thing to be able to subdue that threat is, you know, shoot someone. Yeah. And then it turns out to be other information afterwards. It can it can ruin you. It can you know it can yeah. it can ruin you when you were completely in the right at the time. Yeah. And how do you what do you do with that? It's it, that is a that is one of the hardest things for a soldier, especially when you mentioned the, the yellow card, especially out in Northern Ireland, mate. Yeah. Especially out in Northern Ireland, and those rules of engagement is, oh my God, yes, they was. I just remember them being very very complex in terms of, uh, and very a lot of in my head, grey is at the time. Well, can I? I shoot in this circumstance could I shoot or could I not even just in the train leading up you know mate yeah yeah Epic. I mean that that's the thing you you read the yellow card you know, and it's you know so I can like can give you an example um you know so on, on that particular tour um we had uh <clears throat> like a, a foot patrol that was out in turf lodge and again the IRA had taken over house um the i'm guessing the night before like had a shoot essentially set up and um as the patrol essentially <clears throat> walked down this particular particular street or road um they opened fire and um we had one one guy that was killed instantly with a with a shot to the head and then as i guess they fired a, a burst of rounds probably from an M16 or something similar and then like exited the the property but you know again it's like what do you do you know it's trying to locate the firing point you've got somebody that's that's been killed you've got somebody else that's been wounded you're trying to think about you know can can you return fire not return fire um what was um you know what was actually interesting about that incident is that they actually eventually prosecuted the 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 guy that actually fired the weapons oh. so um which is a um so in the follow-up kind of cordon and search um it obviously left through the rear of the house had, had a balaclava which he discarded in the coal bunker of a of another house and 
um, obviously it's a very slick operation when they leave because they're given a change of clothes, they're like bath, they're like, so there's no traces of cordite on them, they're shaved or whatever. Um, but he, in his kind of panic, he discarded the, and, um, and it was found, and there were hairs from his head. Uh, um, you have DNA testing then? I think so, yeah. Well, they were, they were definitely able to, yeah, yeah, you know, it, to yeah. kind of match it. Um, so, again, you know, th- just lucky, I guess, that, you know, they made a mistake and we were able to ultimately, he, he was prosecuted. Yeah. I think the worst thing here is that I, I don't know um, what happened to him. I don't know whether he's still alive. I don't know whether he was released, you know, under the kind of peace accord. Um but again, you know those those things, you you don't forget because at the end of the day, um, you know you still think about um, the guy that that isn't now living his life, didn't mm. have the chance to you know to have a life, a family, and everything else. So um, yeah, that that definitely that definitely stays with you. Mm. How so? How um, how frequent were? How frequent was was there? So in, in Northern Ireland at the time, and, and granted, you, you you can only sort of ballpark it because you were the mm. unit, the IGJ. But I mean, how often were there engagements on to British forces and the RUC while you, while you know I don't know, let's say on a, on a day or, or a week. No, it's probably. Um, I know it varied. Yeah, yeah, probably. But, I mean, if you if you think about the, I mean, we were in Belfast. I have a feeling actually, two para might have been in Cross Midland or okay. down on the border at the time. Um, and then we had like the Royal Highland Fusiliers, I think, were like the permanent battalion as well. Um, but I would say, you know, you're probably getting incidents of some kind every few weeks, mm. um, you know, and that that could be, you know, that could be a shoot, that could be a suspected ID, it could be a bomb. Well, you're talking about as your unit, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then, you know, would be, obviously we're carrying like... Um, ECM equipment as well because there was still the threat. Obviously, you didn't have mobile phones at the time, but you could still, mm. you know, detonate a device using, um, you know, radio control, etc. Um, so, you know, that was always a risk as well. Um, where were there? Uh, uh, sorry, at the time, um, where were there? Where was there? Common places to try and hide the IEDs because this is this is really interesting to me. So, my yeah. majority of my ID experience is is. Middle East. I, I mean, I did some Northern Ireland training and stuff like yeah. that, but I can vaguely remember that. Yeah. But can you can you remember? Where the yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I I remember before like on that before that tour, I went and did um, the Royal Engineers kind of search course. I was on a search team oh, okay. as well, yeah. um, which meant you know if we got something that um, you know there there may be something that's hidden somewhere. Um, you know, then then we go out and uh, and obviously do a full search, try and recover what whatever um, whatever was there. So, um, yeah, I mean, typical things like dustbins. You know, so you might have a dustbin hidden behind a wall. Um, no steel at that time, wasn't it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or it could be, you know, like somewhere on waste ground where they know that, you know, essentially you're going to kind of patrol across that. So they're always, you know, they're always. I guess there's always dickers out. You know, they're always looking for patrols to set a pattern, particularly light foot patrols. So, you know, again, it could be something, yeah, we'll just put something in a dustbin, for example, or some rubbish, or on waste ground. Um, or even, in a, you know, it might be a car. They could, so essentially, and then it would be typically detonated via radio control. Were they incorporating mortars at the time as well? Yeah, not so much in Belfast though. I think like when you got certainly when you got down to like Cross Midland and mm. the border, um, you know, then having the the mortars deployed on like the flatbeds and stuff like that, it was it was probably easier to you know to get that kind of uh, that kind of uh, attack. But Belfast, I would say more you know more shootings, bombs, risk of of IEDs. It's crazy to think back now, isn't it? To when you think. We talk about there. People think uh, you know. Well, it's 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 not Ireland, man. It's part of the UK. It's yeah, part, it's like part of the UK. Yeah. And even up till the end of, I mean, the late nineties, there was those kind of attacks going on. 
in the UK. You, know, people, people, you can go across it now without a passport. That's bad. Yeah, yeah, it's, no. It's unbelievable to think back and find 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 things like that. Mortars, M sixties, flipping machine guns. Yeah, you know, yeah. assault rifles, sniper rifles, yeah. IEDs. Un- you just un- think unreal. Where you know where, where are they? Well, I guess we know where they were getting that kind of weaponry, but you know, well, the, fact they, the fact they can get it into you know into Northern Ireland, well into Ireland, and then across the border, and so it know. must have been coming across from somewhere. Yeah, in a boat, in boats, yeah. smuggling across yeah. in boats. Yeah, yeah. I, I've I've never thought of that until now. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I think you know it was. Um, it's interesting because, like, when you get to kind of this age, and uh, you know, obviously, I talk to a lot of guys like like yourself. You know, that obviously have have served in you know some pretty um, pretty hardcore places, and it, it's funny. It's like it's, I don't think it's like Northern Ireland's forgotten in any way i just think you know it's like um you know a lot of guys didn't get to experience that i mean they've had their own experiences which you know have been absolutely hardcore iraq afghan etc i don't know what the final you know the final kind of you know almost death toll was for for operation banner bearing in mind it was over a long period of time but i'm pretty sure it's in excess of 700 mm. you know over you know o- yeah. over that time period i i i often thought i've often sort of wondered a bit what what um how hard it must have been to operate it's almost counting insurgency i suppose in the way mm. so, you know um in in ireland uh in in the way that haven't they considered much the same things as like we did in iraq or afghan but then operating northern ireland uh, um must have been a lot harder in a way uh to outsmart the enemy because they're english speaking right the westerners they're british so they understand exactly what makes you the soldier tick they understand you know uh they they understand the culture they know how to get around things they also have that have that so they know that a, a young looking lad you know um who's on a patrol let's say he's in the front line of you know he's got he's in riot situation you yeah know, and, and you know these let's find the young lad yeah because they know full well that young lad's just done seven six seven eight months of training eight six seven eight months before that he was a kid you know they know go and target him yeah and they speak his language they know exactly where to nip to pick yeah. him yeah. you don't have that problem in in the middle east where they speak a different language don't understand the culture they don't understand the training, yeah, you know, and and probably it's as hard for them to spot a young British person and try and guess accurately guess their age as it as it is for us to spot a, a young or an old Arab person. We look completely different, yeah, you know, yeah. and we age completely differently. Yeah, uh, what, what was that challenge? It must have been horrendous. Yeah, because I think you know again, and they know the way around the law. Yeah, they know the way oh, around yeah. the law. So uh, <laughs> I think that I think that's the thing. It, it's you know, I mean, one they've got obviously a lot of they had at the time a lot of funding um you know very very good lawyers representing them um who obviously you know knew the law inside out um because it's the same laws um british laws essentially and you know they they absolutely knew their rights and that could be as you know as much as stopping Jerry Adams on his way, you know, from the Sinn Féin office down the Falls Road. I mean, you know, he used to get stopped multiple times a day. Um, and he knew exactly what he needed to, what he had to tell you and basically what he didn't. You know, I mean, it must have been a right, that's about the best we could do in terms of like fucking up his day, you know, stopping him eight times <laughs> from leaving the Sinn Féin office to getting down the other end of the Falls Road. But um, yeah. You know, they, they they know their rights, they know the law very well, and they obviously use that to their advantage, and you're right. You know, they, they could definitely they could say, look, that lad, 19, probably fresh out of training, doesn't know much. Um, you know, we could probably get him to react, or whatever it is, you know. I mean, it, it, it and that that's the strange thing, that um, I think it was only once that we actually went into the city centre in cities, because apart from that, we're in green kit all the time. You don't leave your location apart to go back for R and R for a week or whatever. But it was weird because, like, you're you're kind of in the city centre. There's 
this is showing my age, there's a fucking Woolworths, you know, with the old pick and mix. I remember Woolworths. And, <laughs> oh, there you go, mate. You made me feel better. <laughs> anyway, there's a Woolworths with a pick and mix. You're like, actually, yeah, I wouldn't mind going in and just, you know, getting a bag of, like, jelly babies or whatever. But it was weird because you're in this kind of situation where, you know, you can't say anything. Um, you know, we had we had someone with us that was armed, just had, like, a, you know, basically a nine mil um concealed but you can't talk to anyone because you've got british accent and you know but it, it yeah it's a surreal when you're it's almost like you could be on the streets of a you know of a city it could be parts of london or birmingham or manchester or whatever but you know but i think there's always this like this there was always this like undercurrent of this this is a violent place you know you could just you could feel it um and i think the thing that was kind of depressing about it was that you could see that it, it was just like passed from generation to generation um so you know like there used to be a big flats complex which anyone will served in belfast will know um, it was called divis flats they pulled it down now um but we used to have an op you know on the on the top and um yeah i mean it was just like it was a it was just like a rat run of you know of different like different walkways and stuff and they used to carry up, you know, fridges and cookers and stuff like that to the roof and then try and push it off on the patrols below. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the you know, the kids used to pick up lumps of dog shit you know, and throw it at you, whatever they could pick up. You know, they might just literally be walking and talking, but they'd still, you know, swear at you and whatever. You know, it's just like it's... It's just like the venom, you know, is is in, in like just in everything from a from an early age. Wow. Well, so yeah, strange. It is yeah, strange I, environment really. When uh, so I never <clears throat> I never really experienced that in Northern Ireland. Experienced that you know, um, patrolling around the built up areas, high threat areas. Mm. I think when I went in two thousand and one, in two thousand and one, I don't I certainly don't recall even doing much stuff on foot. Yeah. Two thousand and one Christmas and then two thousand and two was. Bally Kelly, yeah, and it wasn't even a long time. It was, I think, it was a couple of months. I yeah, came, I think it came back early for deploying the, the Falklands and the Ruhlman Infantry Company there in turn the two, and then in turn the five. So uh, the Iraq one turn the three, yeah. And it was the, no, and then yeah, sorry, two thousand and four went back out there, and uh, we went back out for the summer, okay, marching season, yeah, yeah, and. That I remember uh, I'd forgotten all about this until I had a guy. I don't know if you listened to this podcast he, a guy called John Bream okay don't know yeah he's mad as a box of fish right? okay. he's mad as a box of fish um, I can't I, I can't remember if we spoke about this on the podcast or not yes we did we did well they he was C Company 3 Power and they yeah. were they went off somewhere to be honest that might be right it's not like they ended up deployed right shields you know um, yeah okay. <laughs> Mark 6 is on yeah flipping the, the uh, neck Nate Pate it's all come back to me now in the vines yeah. uh, hickory sticks right <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they got set up on by the crowd. I don't know. I can't remember the situation. And John Bream. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's like I don't know, seven stone, piss wet through. He's, yeah. I can't. I don't know what weight he boxed at, but he's just nothing to him. Probably um, bantam weight or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and he yeah. got targeted, and yeah. he got dragged out. He got dragged out the line, into the crowd, uh, and, and it was nearly gone. It was nearly. It was nearly. You know, it was nearly taken. This is turn of four, Andy. Yeah, you know, turn of four. So he just. Okay, or each, people don't people forget craziness. Yeah, people now you, you go to Northern Ireland and have a flipping conversation with them. Yeah, you know the same the same people, it's yeah. the same culture. <laughs> yeah. They're now it just it baffles me. He got dragged at the crowd. And thankfully, able to get him back. Um, there's a mate of mine who's out now, and he was one of the drivers of the snatches. Yeah, and they'd managed to rip the door off the back of armored vehicle. He managed to rip the door off the back of the snatch, and they were inside. And they were coming at him with a, a hammer and a, a pickaxe inside the snatch, and he was and he had he had, got to get his rifle. And he was, but but um, bearing in mind, armed, he well within his rights to, to, sh to I shoot. would say, yeah, to coming in to start his head with a hammer, shoot yeah. them. But he, yeah. again, that that ambiguity, yeah, yeah, he would have been dragged across the coals. It would have caused more hassle than not. I mean, you if you go shooting someone in that situation, and it's probably probably the same back but well, maybe the same back when you were serving there in the 80s you know if it's an ambiguous situation or if someone sees ambiguity in it mm. or can pull it out there it yeah. just causes more riots causes more dramas you know so he's fighting off with the butt of his rifle 2004 2004 
And Unbelievable. That, Afghan was happening then. Iraq was happening then. And that was still happening. And that, that Northern Ireland was still happening, trying to kill, trying to kill the British soldiers. And, and you know what? You know, what what's interesting is like, you know, we were talking about this. So I think it's next week, August fourteenth, like fiftieth um, anniversary. Of, August you know, of, of Operation Banner. August August fourteenth. August the fourteenth. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So it was later than that. no, no. So it was like that was the first. That was the uh, you know. F- um, that was the first uh, deployment of British troops, like on the on the fourteenth of August. Um, so that's why they they've obviously got the remembrance kind of service at the National Arboretum on that day. But it, it was funny because like, I was talking to a couple of guys recently um, that again have been out there late seventies, early eighties, and like one of them had been back there recently. You know, wanted to go back because he'd, he'd served there a few times, and um, he, he said, you know, he just didn't feel comfortable and even though we sound like the tourist board will lead you to believe yeah you can go to belfast it's great you're safe you know i'm sure it's you know it's changed hugely but i still don't know like if you're you know a british soldier or serviceman or service woman that served out there i just don't know and you you'd seen that and as you say if that was still happening in 2004 i just think it runs too deep you Mm. know um i mean thank thank god we don't have soldiers on the streets anymore and you know at the end of the day that part of it is over but i I don't believe that just in like you know in a generation or whatever that you're going to change that it's too i mean it's it's just it's too deep and the problems are still there right yeah there's still a lot of violence a lot of murders a lot of the same stuff has gone on that has been this century it was having going on when you were there yeah last century andy when you were there oh yeah yeah that's right yeah (laughs) thanks Um, for reminding me Hugh. <laughs> yeah, um, it's to win the loss slightly, um, but also since British troops are left there, it's very, very underreported, if at all, in, yeah. in the UK. Um, but I say in the UK, in mainland UK, this yeah. is the UK we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, right? yeah. But, I mean, <clears throat> the thing with is, is a problem with Northern Ireland and, and any of these places. Falkland Island is another example. Yeah, where you, people are crying out for it to change back to uh, like chaining your own just it back right Northern Ireland handed back to Irish uh, Falkland Islands handed back to Argentinians but it, it's you it can't it can't be done when it's gone on for a certain period of time decades or yeah. no enough time that there are there's families settled there Northern Ireland is a perfect example and Falkland Islands Argentina is a perfect example because you can't just say yeah, all right, have it back because mm. the things that happened all those years ago, when we were all in different set of circumstances, and yet we may have been in the wrong, we may have been right, whatever. You now are talking about affecting people who it's not their fault, the situation they're in. Yeah, it's not their fault. Yeah, and the fault lines are British. Yeah, they don't want to go back to be to and be all of a sudden. How does that? How does that work? Yeah, how does that work? Yeah, yeah? and who had it before the Argies? Yeah. You know, yeah. If that's the case, if that, if that if that's the case, we can hand everywhere back. Yeah. Is Wales going to? Is Wales and Scotland or the Brythonians? Are they gonna, are they going to get England back? You know, is, uh, are the Americans going to give uh, America back? <laughs> it's the same situation, yeah, yeah, on a course. smaller scale, yeah. and, and, but it, it's yeah. violence involved. Yeah. What do you do? <laughs> what you do? You do? To, I mean, you just you have to find you have to try and find a solution, don't you? A compromise, whatever that is. But yeah, the reality is. I, I just think, you know, it, it, it just, with these things, obviously feeling runs so deep. And I guess it's the same, you know, if you're an Argentinian, like looking at, you know, the Falkland Islands, you're probably thinking, well, you know, that that should be part of Argentina. Um, I've got Argentine family. Have you? Oh, okay. And my cousin, who's younger than me. <laughs> how, right? does that, cousin, how does that work for the, like, family? Uh, uh, f- well, I've got a cousin who's younger than me. I got I got a few cousins. They're all younger than me, but one of them yeah. in particular, very educated, very educated individual, um, highly intelligent. Right? Oh, you bring up the Falklands. I can I can joke with her because she knows I'll just I'll just rip into her. But then if she's had a couple of drinks or if she's like you know in a bad mood, she goes she just, nuclear. Yeah, nuclear. And it's yeah. Like, Whoa. Okay. Oh, let's not talk. Let's stop talking about this now. Yeah. But you're right, you know, that it runs so deep. Very deep. That, um, you know, you if, if most people are honest in terms of the way they feel, and, you know, like, you know, a couple of drinks and, and it starts to come out, 
yeah. then you know that that is that is the way they feel and her, her, her sister so listen to this this yeah so listen <laughs> just remember listen to this so i when when so she got a younger sister i'm trying to remember how old she is anyway uh a lot younger than me and she, so the elder sister ilu she came over to to the uk um and this is the first time she came over had come over since she had become a, become an adult or or uh, late teens right Got so form her own opinions before that we met each other when we were kids yeah yeah and she came over he said oh, she goes back to argentina to buenos aires and she told me this in retrospect and her younger sister brenda um went mental at her because she said oh yeah Hugh, he's he, yeah he's a nice guy da, da, da. what do you mean he's a nice guy he's in the british army and uh, outright was refusing to even accept that and I'm the cousin. You'd <laughs> accept that I was, uh, you know, she should even, that her older sister should even be talking to me yeah, but because the British got the Falklands. But you're, <laughs> but you're part of the family. <laughs> I know. Hey, That's unbelievable. Insane. But what do you do? So I reckon it's got to be, it's got to be like as it is now, like with Northern Ireland. Well, maybe not the Falklands, with Northern Ireland. Sort of, you got to stick a pacifier in the mouth of the people who are angry. And go, yeah, you, uh, we'll pull the troops out and we'll sort of let everything die down and we'll just do little things here and there. And you basically need the idea to die out. Yeah. Because it can't be fixed. Yeah. Israel, Palestine, Argentina, Falklands. And, yeah. uh, and that works if those, if the country, if, if both countries are sort of in a decent financial place, you know, decent you know, economical place, they're all right. But I mean, one of the reasons Argentina and the Falklands has dragged on, because mm. Argentina have been on their ass. For years, yeah, real yeah. dramas, massive yeah. dramas, yeah. And the Falklands got oil, you know. Yeah, it's natural resource, and it's a distraction right? from internal problems. Yeah, and that you know, I guess you know, thinking back to the kind of history of like you know of, of the Falklands, that was all about at the time, wasn't it? Galtieri just basically trying to take the heat off, you know, the 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 economic kind of woes back at home in mm. Argentina, and I guess you know it's like. It, it, the same in, in a way with with Northern Ireland, you know, in the in the like seventies and eighties, you know, high unemployment, you know, like poor housing, poor kind of education, you know, um, poor facilities, um, and you know, again, it's like that's when organisations like the Provisional IRA or whatever, I guess, you know, can start to kind of exert that, you know that kind of rhetoric almost like on the population you know actually they're they're just exploiting you know that that you know the the, the conditions that people are experiencing and, and living in um but yeah it's it's definitely it's one that is incredibly difficult to solve mm. and um you know i think at least the peace process you know bought uh, a semblance of you know of uh, of stability almost. I mean, I, as we've said, I, d I don't believe that, you know, that kind of deep-seated feeling, you know, that, that kind of hatred has, has probably uh, has probably dissipated completely, but... Um, oh, I bet you got some of those rural villages oh, on Ireland, man. Yeah. You do not be walking... You want, you do not want to be walking in there... No. ...with a, with a like, mainland British... No. ...English accent. No. Maybe Welsh could get away with it, or Scottish. You, you might be all right, mate. English should definitely be definitely <laughs> fucked. But, but literally, I, again, it's like last week I was talking to um, uh, like another uh, guy who served in to RGJ and then went on the circuit for a while and um, like one of his friends was, was killed um, and uh, they went back for his funeral. And I think that was actually, I mean, it was close. It was Southern Ireland, but it was close to the border. And they said, literally, you know, it was a small place, one pub, um, and there were a lot of they were they were kind of warned before, you know, just to be just to be careful. And people were asking about them, who are they, why are they here? They knew they were British soldiers, but they were basically told, look, leave them alone. They're here for for the wake, you know, just just leave them be. Mm. So again, you know, that that feeling is obviously still prevalent. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, anyway. Yeah. yeah. How would you look back on your time when you served? Um, yeah, it's it's interesting, you know. It's like I'm. I think it. Uh, I think it taught me a lot about myself. Um, it taught me a lot about, 
you know the kind of the value of um good leadership like the value of you know of um really yeah really kind of putting you know really putting your the people that you work with first so you know we had some really good ncos um that that really really looked after you know like the lads um particularly when they were you know when you're young you're like you're 19 20 you know it, it so I, I look back at my time and i'm right i'm really like proud you know like i'm glad that i served um and yeah i think you know broadly like my military experience you know gave me a bit of determination you know it's like it, it, you're always gonna have problems in your life um but you know if you crack on you know you you can you can find a way through typically um and actually it's been interesting because as like my careers you know after after i left the army you know i was to be honest here yeah, I, I would say i was pretty lost for a while um because all of a sudden like your family you know <coughs> have, have gone um and like all of your your kind of mates from home have kind of moved on um you know you haven't you had you you maybe lose your identity a bit i would say um and i worked in i worked for a publishing company for quite a few years in the sales role and it was fine um but you know it, it just didn't you know it, it just didn't it didn't it wasn't fulfilling it didn't feel like you know it was something i could do for the rest of my life um so i had a lot of questions i think about you know who who am i really what is it i really want to do you know um and um it was funny because i did some sport parachuting in the army um literally at um at bad lip swinger which was like the the army parachute center in germany at the time what was it called bad lip swinger Bad lip springer. springer. Yeah. Is that the actual name? Or uh, yeah. No, no, I'm not making <laughs> I thought they said bad lip swinger. <laughs> no, no, there was no lip swinging going on, mate. That was in Hanover, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, like did a, a static line jump course there. Um, like, love that. And then, um, like, didn't really do any more. Maybe did one other weekend or something like that. And then, um, you know, like, I woke up one morning and thought, fuck it, I can't do this anymore. And, like, you know, I fucking hate this job. Um, like, I just feel a bit lost. And um, what were you selling? Selling publishing space, basically. To, you know, business to business yeah. magazines. <clears throat> um, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go and do an accelerated free fall course. So, um, like, I called up um, a guy called Kevin McCarthy, whose whose father actually is ex special forces. Um, and he's he was basically running a, a company called the Freefall Company up at Skydive Sibson at Peterborough, as it was. So he said, yeah, you could come up next week. So I just booked some time off, um, went up and literally started my AFF course. Um, and that was it. Just like fell in love with skydiving um, and then ended up. I went to work in the States for a year for a company that manufacture um, the harness container systems um, and then uh, and do they produce a lot of rigs for oh, the for parachuting? Year. Yeah, military parachuting, parachuting. Yeah, no, for well, sport and military. So they, it's a company called Sunpath. So they manufacture equipment for the U.S. military, yeah. um, but also sport parachuting equipment. So I was there for a bit, um, came back, and then decided that I was going to go to New Zealand. Um, but you make some pretty like significant changes when you're unhappy. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Publishing and, to you know, skydiving exactly. in New Zealand, <laughs> and then. So, you know, went over there and actually I just met my wife as she is now before we went and we decided, you know, yeah, why not? Let's go. Um, so I got my tandem instructor qualifications out there in New Zealand and also in Australia. Um, yeah, and we, we ended up at a place called Wanaka, Skydive Wanaka, which is for anyone that knows New Zealand, it's described as an alpine village. It's just north of Queenstown in um, in South Island. And it's just like, this amazing place like the lake is beautiful you've got Mount Asparing in the background Mount Asparing National Park so the, mo the mountains are snow capped most of the year uh, it's the fourth largest lake in New Zealand um, just this beautiful place and um, yeah that's where we hung out for nearly four years so um, yeah I was working for as it was tandem skydive on occur so some days we'd rock up we'd do 20-25 tandem jumps in a day um, 
yeah, it was just this amazing lifestyle. If the weather was, you know, was it was if we had cloud or the winds were over the top for for jumping, you know, as long as we could be contacted within an hour, um, we could do anything. We could mountain biking, kayaking, like hill walking. You know, it was just this incredible place. Um, but it's like all things, you know. It's like I think we decided that it was a long way from the UK, and like we missed our families and. Um, and also I was conscious, you know, I was getting on a bit, um, probably couldn't be a tandem instructor for the rest of my life, mate. <laughs> and, um, so that was it. So we, so we ended up, did about in the end, probably, you know, probably about 3000 skydives, um, okay. which is awesome. Epic. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, ended up coming back to the UK and then, um, I thought, you know what, I need to get a degree. And then that was really the start to my, you know, like to my, what I would call, my second career. Uh, really. How old were you when you came back from New Zealand? Oh, if you don't mind God. me asking. No, no, not at all. Um, so I would have been um, late 30s. Okay. Yeah. And then decided to get a degree then? Yeah. So, um, you know, went to um, the business school at the University of Portsmouth. Um, that we came back. Um, yeah, rented a place for a little while. And then we managed to buy a house in um, South Sea. Um, my wife was working and then I was studying and, and um, working part time just to pay the mortgage and stuff um, yeah like enjoyed university I mean, it was pretty strange on the first day rocking up there's all these kids obviously like 18, 19 and they're like what are you doing here mate what's your story you know like this old guy um, <laughs> but, um, but I, to be honest you, I just wanted to get it done you know and it's like I managed to 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 get to, so basically I was studying kind of marketing and business, and um, the University of Portsmouth had this scheme where essentially you could do the last year of your degree, so you could work, and then like your dissertation you would do as a company project, so it's it's called a partnership program. So I went back to work for the the publishing company, but in a marketing role, um, finished my degree there. And um, yeah, you know, got a first and as I should have done, cause I had to crack on with it and, and get it done. Um, and then, yeah, from there, you know, I just ended up um, working for a, a, com a technology company called DoubleClick that was acquired by Google. Worked for a couple of big uh, media agencies and then went to work for Google and and then Facebook. Oh, I didn't realize you worked for Google. Yeah, so I was at Google for a couple of years oh. before, before Facebook. Are you doing that in London? Yeah. Because their office is quite quirky as well, isn't it? They're pretty quirky. Well, you know, obviously, you've been to the Facebook office, which... Yeah, you pick and mix floor. The pick and mix floor. <laughs> the only thing is, mate, every time I, st you know, I walk past it, I think of Woolworths in the centre of fucking Belfast. <laughs> 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 oh, can I actually go in there and, like, you know, touch those yeah. jelly babies? Yeah. Anyway. Um, uh, the, um... Over time... Sorry, going back. Over time, when you left... When you left the military, oh, you, you, you mentioned uh, struggling a bit and sort of uh, sense of purpose. You know what what yeah. what you need. You, so there's a missing your community gone. One of the interesting thing you said actually, which I've, I'd never considered until you said it there, and absolutely right, is not only when you leave does your sense of community go, oh, your your community go, your family disappears, yeah. and and everything you stand for within that family. Also, like you said, your friends have grown up; they've moved on. Yeah, you haven't. You can't just walk back into the thing that you knew five, ten years before. No, you know, even if you have like like I did, even if you kept in touch with them throughout your military career, yeah. you go home every so often and seeing them, you're still sort of outside of it, and you get back into falling back into the routine you did before you joined. That's it. I did never considered that until yeah. another sort of mitigating factor of a hardship when you leave. Yeah, you know, re reintegrating because I think you you feel it's very easy to feel lost because you know you're you like your military family you know have gone um yeah of course you'd still keep in contact with some of your mates or whatever but you know it's not it's not the same um you don't have the same i think you know it's like not having the same support network you know that's kind of gone and then you know as you say it's like they're still your mates at home but they've all moved on and they don't and they, they they don't necessarily kind of you know you've changed as well and you've yeah. got a completely different you don't you don't understand what their habits are what makes them tick you know yeah uh, what is acceptable to go out and to socialize and yeah weird weird 
How, uh, what did, did you do anything to sort of, a, apart from the, the career side of things, you know, yeah. chopping and training and doing crazy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you, how did that situation improve over time from a community aspect? Um, yeah, your sort of social, co- well, the reintegration, how, how did that yeah. improve over time? So I think, um, being honest with you, like skydiving was a big thing for me because it, it, repl- it became my family um and that's because you know there was it was quite a close knit group of people you know there was like there was a bit of a bond Mm -hmm. um and like you know literally i used to kind of live for my weekends you know it's like friday night i kind of finish work like throw my rig in the car throw a sleeping bag you know drive up to like sibson um to scott of peterborough um you know and the bar would be open like you know everybody and it was almost like being back you know like being back in the army like walking into the naffy you like and all the lads are there you know and it's like you'd have a couple of beers um and then you know we'd spend like the whole weekend skydiving um again you know a few beers on saturday night pack up on sunday you know drive back back to work and that and then you know that became like okay let's go to california for a week or let's go to florida for a week or let's go to spain or portugal for a week so there were a lot of kind of skydiving trips so i I hadn't i hadn't really expected that like when you know when i thought i'm gonna just that was very much spur in the moment i'm gonna go and do that aff course but it very quickly became um like my my new family it's interesting the the way you spoke about that is that it's also a it's an, it's an example of a of a of a, a type of community which is sort of closer to the, the kind of a, a military community than would other communities be. You know, you get yeah. What you get, you get flipping YMCA's, mate, and you get you know <laughs> working men's clubs, and you get other yeah you know, yeah yeah and, and 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 rugby and stuff like that. But yeah, it's interesting that, that the the kind of people who are going to be involved in that kind of job yeah are are you know more risk takers for example yeah they've probably had a, a quite a varied background exciting background yeah um they've probably got very similar tastes in in what gets them going yeah so yeah uh, uh, um and that's and and again that's something that fixed it for you without without you realizing it sort of helped it, it which is which is a very similar experience to what i'm having with team rubicon okay yeah really similar yeah. i've mentioned it before i've mentioned it and i'll give a talk yeah i like mentioned it there and it's it's that that the it's a a community where it's a disaster response charity. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, they and so the people who are willing to be involved with it are generally yeah. got the same background as he's talking about. Yeah. same similar things that make them tick, yeah. and they don't necessarily have the ex-military. And without knowing it, I'm I'm part of that community. All of a sudden, without knowing it, it's, it's benefited me. Without yeah. going looking for it, it's like yeah, oh, okay, right, yeah, cool. I think cool. that you know, if there's one thing. You know, and you, you like it's brilliant that you found it with like Rubicon. You know, because and again, I think Rubicon do a, you know like an incredible job, um, and you know it's making a difference to a lot of people's lives. Right, you know who aren't have the same level of kind of privilege perhaps that we do. Um, but I think the the key thing is finding another community, whatever that is. You know, and that might be, you know, I know some guys that have found it like you say through rugby like through the local club or like through you know joining um like a triathlon club or you know whatever it is um like was for me i I didn't really i will i guess if i look back at it i was pretty lost at the time and i you know and i knew that i knew that i had to find something and it just so happened worked out that 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 was it and it was nice because there were quite a few quite a few um like um ex forces guys as well you know that had, had left the military but had been parachuting or skydiving you know so um it was this kind of nice kind of mix of like you know some ex forces guys um you know and then you had you know perhaps um you know slightly more kind of laid back risk takers that were maybe you know a bit more willing to partake in you know some of the uh softer drugs and uh, other things you know that i think just naturally people in you know if they if they 
are attracted to those types of sports it's that type of kind of hedonistic lifestyle that sometimes you know so you've got this interesting kind of mix that seems to you know work really well mm. um so yeah you know i really it was it was good for me and um yeah you know i spent probably 10 years you know and then i think the reason i start one you know family and um i think you know it got to a point where a lot of people had started to give up and maybe they were having their own families you know we had a few a few of our mates killed um different you know skydiving accidents often like canopy accidents under high performance canopies um a couple of people that i know killed base jumping um and uh yeah i just thought you know maybe it's time to you know time to 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 do something else Mm. Uh, but i still miss it you know i still like you know still got photos all over the house um you know different places spain florida california new zealand you know just wonderful places to kind of jump and spend time with people Mm. yeah how connected uh how connected um is the northern island veteran community when you sent me a link yesterday was it a couple of links yesterday yeah um I saw one of them was a it was a Northern Ireland veterans sort of forum. Yeah, I didn't even know that Rivets. existed. Yeah, that existed. Yeah. So how how connected are you, are you all? Uh, is that community? Yeah. So there's there's a few groups on Facebook. Um, Nivets is um, essentially the main kind of um, I guess organisation for Northern Ireland veterans. So um, that's quite an active community. Um, like I'm a member of that. I mean, it, you know, it's nothing. It's like a tenner a year um but it's it's a nice way to kind of stay in contact you know with with other veterans and um obviously with the you know this kind of anniversary um of operation banner i mean there's the royal british legion event at the arboretum but then uh, nivets are also putting on an event i think in northern ireland as well Mm -hmm. in lisbon um but yeah i mean it's there's a couple of groups on facebook where you know a lot of people will kind of upload photos um chat about those you know those kind of 70s 80s 90s kind of tours um yeah so i think it's it's you know it's and and the the forums are pretty active um so yeah you know a lot of people i guess it's good to be able just to talk about your experiences or you know connect with other people you know i guess a lot of other guys went through it you know at the same time because you know that essentially if you're in the army i guess you know in the after the falklands i mean realistically cyprus maybe uh germany the uk you know maybe exercises you know in different parts of the world canada belize whatever kenya um but yeah it was really northern ireland was you know were the main kind of operational tours do you know what i'd completely forgotten about until the last until the last the last podcast with yeah. steen thornton yes the gulf war mate i know yeah, I, I hate myself. I can't believe. I can't believe it. Yeah, I can't believe I've forgotten all. How does that happen? Oh, I, no. I, I've, I, you know, I said a lot. I said a lot, a lot of podcasts. You know, like between between the like, eighty-two of the Falklands and then and then sort of um, Iraq, Afghan. Not much went on. No, the Gulf War. The Gulf War. <laughs> actually, that's bad because I forgot the Gulf. I know, is it? And that, I think, yeah. I that's... think. Do you know what I think? It was so short. Yeah. It was such a short thing. Don't get me wrong. It was nineteen ninety, you know, wasn't it? Ninety-one. Yeah, yeah. Things, but it was such a short thing. It's almost. And it doesn't get mentioned. No. It doesn't get mentioned by media anymore, does it? No. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Isn't that weird? So you don't hear anything, you don't really hear anything about the golf, very little. And you think, see about you know, that convoy they got brassed up. Yeah. You yeah. Know, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, there's a lot and, of. And the, and, the, and, the, and the massive airstrikes and, the, yeah. and and there's some proper iconic footage of that yeah. war. Yeah. Craziness raining down on Cuba. As you say, there was that, you know, there was the big, like, blue and blue incident you know with the uh, with the americans mm. um yeah. so yeah i mean that again it's like why we don't hear anything odd, about yeah. that that is odd um, that is odd yeah that is odd um can we go to facebook yeah of course you know meetings before on chats what's what's really interesting oh in fact let's let's go a step back where where um where where you first introduced yourself to me via a stage, no, not directly to me. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the Facebook booster event. Yeah and, yeah, and that's where, you know, you, you mentioned where, yeah. you're a veteran. And, um, so why why is there, where has it come from, the drive on at the minute with supporting veterans from Facebook? So I think it's a few things. 
so I think like for me personally like I've been dis- disconnected from the military community I felt I've been disconnected from the military community for quite a long time um I, obviously I've always you know always uh deeply passionate about helping veterans and um the armed forces community and like you know been doing different charity events over the years like I did a uh, a couple of years ago did a 100 kilometer ultra from London to Brighton for um that was for blind veterans did uh, I've done a few uh soldier 20 sorry soldier 30 30 events over Exmoor um which is basically 30 miles with um 30 pounds a kit like just for time um did that for five years that was all about you know raising money and just doing what I could um but at Facebook I realized that I had the opportunity to try and really push the veterans agenda and I think um one because you know Facebook's had this incredibly tough news cycle and some people may say well you know that's justified with Cambridge Analytica and all the rest of it I've not got an issue with that by the way yeah I've got no issue yeah. with that I've got no yeah. issue with it it's got painted so bad in, I, I'd forgotten about this it got painted so bad in the media sorry for the digress because it really no, flipping no, it's, annoys it's, me yeah. it's like they did something wrong no 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 they did what loads of other companies do all of the time. Yeah. It just so happened, the drama with Trump and the drama with that flipping election and the Russians, ooh, Cambridge Analytica thing. gained information by legal means, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, it was yeah. legal. Yeah, yeah. Everything, I, yeah. I couldn't spot any legal yeah. thing in there. Yeah. It's like, no. I, 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 uh, well, I'll, I'll have to, that's a different podcast. Yeah, no, no, we, yeah <laughs> that, that's definitely, a, that's definitely another one. Ridiculous, man. Ridiculous. But I think, you know, I think sorry you know, no no you know, it's <laughs> well, like, yeah, well, you know it's it, it, when you look at you know i mean there's you know 2.4 billion people on the platform i mean there's never been a platform that has that many people that are using it every single day um you know when you've got to start managing content you know that people are uploading um and look there's always going to be people that are going to use those platforms you know for for criminal purposes i mean it's it's just or for their to their own ends so you know that that no one has ever had this problem before um because nothing there's never been a platform that has so this scale yeah. Yeah. yeah so you know i mean what i i would say and you know is that i genuinely believe the company at the highest level is trying to address this and you know yeah people might say well yeah but at the end of the day it's all about making money it's all about advertising yeah advertising is the business model but you know there's a lot of investment into you know trying to develop the platform in a way that that it that it that it provides social good um and that would actually it's a nice kind of way into to the to the boost program because um part of the facebook mission (coughs) is you know to to empower anyone with a great idea to build a business and like whereas years ago, you know, you might have to have a premises and, you know, you, you'd, you'd probably um, have to invest more money and in, in infrastructure to be able to get, st- to get started. Whereas now, literally, you know, you got 50 quid, you can start advertising on Facebook or Instagram. You know, and we're seeing that a lot, you know, lots of new companies kind of springing up on the platform. So the idea behind Boost was to say, well, look, our company mission is to support people with great ideas you know we've got a lot of veterans leaving the military that actually have got brilliant ideas that are starting businesses and we owe it to them you know to try and help them get the best out of our platforms um in order to you know to 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 grow a successful business um and that's where it came from and you know literally it's like anything if you're passionate about something you go and pitch it um so you know i pitched it to um to our small business team and they said yeah great let's do it you know and then they they invested and that was the first event you know that you came to um you know and that was a brilliant moment you know just to see a room full of you know 300 basically veterans um and um you know we had a you know i i think we had a good line up and you know i think the training was was useful to everybody i, I think the other thing you that you know really struck me was just like the the value of having everyone together in a room like the networking 
and um steve hatch who you know is is a great guy he's the vice president of facebook in the uk he doesn't really have a connection to the forces but you know he was he was incredibly passionate um about you know the the essentially the veterans and and um the cause for veterans and um yeah he was just blown away by you know that that kind of spirit in the room um so i think it was a, it was a great event and the good thing is that we're now going to run another one on the 22nd of october in london and then we're thinking also about how we can we can take it regionally as well so we can you know i don't want the guys in scotland or Wales to feel left out <laughs> all down in cornwall so you know you've got to make it a yeah. national thing <clears throat> Not sure if Northern Ireland as well. Northern Ireland, yeah. I don't think I'll be running one in Belfast, but I might oh, outsource wasn't Facebook that one. registered in Ireland. What was that? It was reg- Facebook was registered in Ireland, isn't it? Oh, that's in so- that's yeah, that's yeah. We've got a big office in yeah, Dublin. Yeah. yeah, I might run it from yeah. there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I wasn't able to stay for the training in the afternoon. Yeah, I had to shoot. I had to shoot off at midday, unfortunately. But well, mate, you can come in any time for a special one-on-one training session. Well, like in that that swingers place in Germany, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah that's that, mate. That's that's <laughs> after hours. <laughs> um, was bad lip swinger, you mean? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was it? What was I going to say then? No, so yeah, what's what's it, what um, what's interesting you said to me before was the that you've mentioned before. I don't know if you, I don't know if you can talk you can talk about it or not, but it's the proportion of U.S veterans there are in in the u.s facebook offices it's something yeah. staggering like three or four percent yeah i think it's 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 definitely two and it might be going on for three percent now like two yeah, or two or three? yeah 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 it's definitely uh, definitely two it might and so yeah i mean it's it's really impressive like the program the uh, veterans engagement program we have in the u.s um it's led by a really lovely lady called felipe um who i think is ex-us army and um yeah she's you know again incredibly passionate about veterans really driven this program so yeah they've hired yeah i mean it's definitely two percent of the workforce are classified as as veterans um and you know they're doing a lot of work to to bring veterans into lots of different roles so um you know it might be policy um it might be engineering it might be security cyber security it could be marketing um We've got um, a wonderful lady in the marketing team in the US, in California, who used to fly fast jets for the Marines off carriers. Oh, my God. Um, so, you know, you've got, you've got this fantastic um, community of veterans within Facebook. So we, we have this organization called Facebook Vets and Allies. So the vets, obviously, you're a veteran, the allies. You know, it might be a family member or, you know, you might have a... A connection to the military so they still want to be part of that that family but um yeah they you know they they put on a lot of events more so in the u.s because that's where a lot of the veterans are but we're we're trying to expand that to the uk so we've set up a, a vets and allies group in london um obviously you've got one of our brand new t-shirts no, mate it's a very nice t-shirt i didn't um, know you'd set it up in, in london yeah group. yeah 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 so it's in london um and with we what we're now thinking about doing is you know how can we how can we really start to help not not just facebook but other technology organizations understand the value of hiring veterans there's two sides to that though as well it's to, I, 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 yeah, yeah. There's two sides to this i was gonna i want to ask you when i when i left <clears throat> when i left i mean i joined up at i joined up at oh, i would have been I, would, I was around about 18. Okay. No, 99. Yeah, I was around about 18. So, when I signed up at the registry, yeah, uh, the, yeah. the, um, the registry office, what am I talking about? <laughs> the, uh, what do you call oh, it? Recruitment, recruitment office. 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 Yeah. <laughs> the registry yeah. office. Uh, and then when I left, I was, mate, I was so naive as to what options there were to go and work as because, and this is the way I thought back then, not that Facebook existed back then, but. Yeah, of course. But, um, Oh, have you thought about approaching Facebook for a job? Facebook, do I know about you know marketing or yeah. you know or, or like tech, yeah. f- software, that internet? I've yeah. got a clue, and and that's the level of naivety I had. So the only options I could see because I didn't know was uh, 
CP, I got into security, or CP, which yeah, I did. You did. And then yeah. what was the other thing? Oh, I can go do project management. We're all project managers. That is a classic. We're all project managers. Great. Yeah, great. And everyone's project manager in the military. Great. Yeah. But can you throw me more than just two options? You know, because you don't understand. There's one, um, how do you bring, uh, uh, you sort of uh, bringing people into those technological, organi- technical, technological organizations, technology organizations. But yeah, how do you bring them in? How do you make people more aware? Because one of the things I realized, even just over the last few years, is yeah, last few years, is like, all right, look at Facebook. Yeah. Look at Marsat. Look at, you know, we spoke recently about tech vets. Yeah, yeah. Look at flipping HSBC. I don't know anything about banking. Yeah. I don't know going to be going to finance. Yeah, yeah. hang on a minute. Every single one of those organizations, they've all got the same departments. They've got yeah. HR departments. There's a million yeah. different types of job of HR. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to be a, you know, you say HR, I think Clark. No. No. The marketing no. department. So many different jobs in marketing. There's, li- yeah. there's so many different yeah. jobs. Yeah. It's almost like choose your job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, have a look at the jobs you're available, not what you think the the the, the organisation does. It's, it was a real eye opener for me to yeah. realise. Yeah. But I I understand so that. So naive. I I understand that, and I think, you know, and I you know, people have different opinions, and I'm sure the job of like the CTP is hard, right? You know, at the end of the day, yeah. I'm, I'm being I'm being like PC here. You know, at the end of the day. You know, they probably think, okay, we've got 15,000 service leaders a year or whatever it is, right? You know, if we can get 90% of them into a job, then, you know, we've done our bit, right? It's mission success. But the reality is where where I think things are going wrong at the moment is that there's a lot of guys and, and girls that are leaving the forces, right, that, you know, could actually do so many things and they probably just aren't aware of what's out there Absolutely. and what they could do and you know i i don't i'm thinking of definitely about how we can fix this um and obviously we're having some conversations and you know i mean i just think that is such a big opportunity so if you could you know connect to to people that are leaving right and you could open their eyes and say actually there are all of these companies that are looking to hire veterans, right? And there were all of these different jobs that you could actually do. Um, you know, and, and you know, you. I'm just thinking about if you were to leave now, maybe you go to a, like careers fair or whatever, and you know, you see a job with Amazon working in logistics, or you see a job, uh, you know, working with BT or whatever, and that's great. You know, like they 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 good jobs, but it, it's like y- you're not really seeing this you know this this kind of um the opportunities that actually exist what you know how about if you could you know if you could reimagine and say actually yeah you know i could be a cyber security expert or i could work in policy or i could actually be a digital marketing expert what's to say that you don't have the expertise you know the ability <clears throat> to do those things and what you know i do see that veterans bring a lot, a lot of the soft skills you know that um <clears throat> a lot of people in business actually aren't good at you know and i mean it doesn't really it doesn't really matter about your rank uh, you know i think you know most people that have served um you have some really really good soft skills on the whole and they understand what good leadership looks like um you know, and they know how to work with people and treat people, and they know how to get stuff done. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, the, the success. I mean, perhaps I'm saying perhaps because it just popped in my head, so I might be talking rubbish. But perhaps, like you know, your success in any role is dependent on you, the basic information you've got that you need to 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 understand the problem or the task. Might be a problem, might be just some task in the yeah. day, and then your application of it. And, and the uh, uh, sorry, how you use that information and, uh, and apply it to solve the problem or complete the task and it's in the application those all of the soft skills come there's other skills too all of the soft skills come in you know and and with um xmill you know very generally speaking very entrepreneurial yeah very good at problem solving yeah very good under pressure very good with time constraints because we've done it literally day in day out since the second we walked into the depot yeah then give them the tools i mean marketing i i i I like uh, I, I like I like the marketing side of things. I like yeah. marketing problems in the past because I see it as uh, as just an example. I try to explain my own process, my own thought process with it because I see it as a 
and let's think right we got this we want to we got this product we want to sell yeah. it how, how do we how do i um how do i get to those people yeah because you gotta yeah. you gotta make sales different these days yeah. so to, to make yourself different that means think outside the box yeah it means how do you cut through it, it cut yeah. through analysis understanding yeah. people being entrepreneurial with the t- with yeah. what you're doing and so it's, so it's not that i've got a, a marketing background and i'm listen i'm a great at it right but I enjoy doing it. I step. I step yeah, yeah. I'm not looking for a job, by the way. I'm no, right. but, but here, listen, <laughs> listen. Like you, you've hit like you know the, the, the basics of marketing. Like you know, on the head, it's like understand the audience. You know, understand what they need. You know, what their problems are, and then you you you're ultimately creating solutions and connecting with them in a way that that's going to engage them. You know, like emotionally. But that that's really it. Um, you know, and you're doing something innovative, which hopefully is going to kind of cut through. Um, but you, you know, you touched on the entrepreneurship and actually, you know, Steve, you know, is, is a great example of somebody that, you know, was in the, in the forces. Steve. Um, Tech from, friends. from, um, um, forces cars direct. Oh, so, sorry. Right, yeah. Yeah. Steve yeah. Thornton. Yeah. Steve Thornton. You know, when you think about Steve, you know, he had, he had a problem, I think, you know, or a bad experience when he was in the army and he, he kind of bought his first car or whatever, you know, left the army, set up forces cars direct. And that, you know, now is, you know, obviously a really successful business <laughs> that I, I, is selling a lot of cars. Um, and the start know, of that process was him saying, oh, I don't want to be a sales, salesman. Exactly. That was the very start. That was, yeah. I can't do that. Yeah, I, I can't, you know, I do. Yeah. And he, you know, in literally, I mean, I, I, and I bought a car from Steve as well. From oh, yeah? yeah. <laughs> and it, like, I, I said to him, gen, you know, and that was actually before I knew it. And I said to him, it was like, it was so, it was brilliant. Like, you know, it's just, it's just the service, really? like the saving, everything. It was just a really nice experience. Um, you know, so I think there's so many stories you've like of, of, of veterans that, you know, have, have, have built successful businesses, have become entrepreneurs. Um, and I think, you know, that that's something that Facebook has to can, you know, continue supporting. Um, because I think like one, you know, our community is pretty vocal when, you know, when when there's a good story. Right. And we need people actually to say, you know what, Facebook is out there doing some good for us. You know, they're, they're giving us the platforms, they're supporting us, they're helping us. Um, use the skills that we learn in the military and apply that, you know, to, to grow businesses. And that ultimately, that's helping the economy, you know, because we're, we're hiring more people um, and it's genuinely kind of driving economic growth. And then I think, you know, the the other part that we, we, we need to play is, you know, is helping veterans find second careers, but in, in technology, you know, not having that as being something they think, oh, I just can't, I couldn't do that. I couldn't possibly do that. Why not? Um, so I think you know that's uh, batteries are gone. That light just gone off, and yeah, gone, gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyway, <laughs> gone. Yeah, bang. Sorry, in darkness. Um, so um, yeah, so I think that's the other area we've really got to focus on. You know, we're we're at an early stage, but I think you know there, there's definitely a commitment. We just need to to work out now. You know how we uh, how we go about that process, um, and I think. There, there definitely is a need for an organization whatever that organization looks like in terms of a structure um but somebody can say okay like you're leaving the you're leaving the forces let me help you like understand your skills let me help you translate the skills that you had in the military to to civilian life or to you know to a corporate or whatever and then let me take you through a process where i can help maybe find you a modern apprenticeship or you know whether it's an internship scheme with different companies that could then give you an opportunity to experience like these different you know the different roles that you may not have considered previously plus getting on the job training um and hopefully a job at the end of it or at the very least maybe you leave after nine months or a year you know with a with a great cv real hands-on experience new training you know, you're going to be in a much better position to, to get a job. Yeah. I and I, I was going to say here, I just think a lot of companies are, are trying to do the right thing and set these it- internship schemes up. Um, but I think we've got to come together and and learn together um, 
and I think the more that we can do that, the more successful we're we're going to be. Yeah, absolutely. I, I um just go just go back. I think there's probably a lot of people listening to this or watching this and screaming, going, "The CTV should be doing that." The CTV, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, and the, the, rea- yeah. the reality, the reality is, they they do a lot of the you know the, um, setting you up for trying getting getting a job and CV yeah. and skills, understanding the roles and as to the best of their ability, you know. Yeah. The CTP do get a hard time. Yeah. But they are, you know, they're trying to they're trying to serve an organisation which itself isn't best suited to working with civvies. I never do. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of, yeah. On the British forces, and plus the the, the resources are hard. And, and yeah. You know, you get different you get different levels of service depending on which office you go through for your CTP training. I mean, mine was a good experience. Uh, on the whole. I could definitely, you know, I needed longer than whatever I got a couple yeah. of weeks ago. It's a ridiculous short amount of time. The resources aren't there to, I mean, to apply it to, to for a longer, uh, a longer scheme. But in terms of the personal service, the lady who, um, the lady who took me through it all was amazing. Yeah. yeah. And I was, you know, I was able to call on her, email her for a good few years after, for assistance, support, guidance, you know. And granted, I doubt you get that from it, you know, every single member of the CTP, but they they haven't got the resources to be able to do it the way it needs to be, and they know this themselves. What what can you do? And you, yeah. something else, something else is needed. I do one hundred percent agree. It's, it's it's not not is being done. Not enough is being done to um to uh, to give veterans the best opportunity of integrating society in, back into um. The, uh, back into civil street in a professional role, not one well, pressure into 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 work, and and that's not as you said, mate. I'm not saying that not enough has been done because well, veterans should be looked after, and we serve that country. Da, 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 da. It's twofold. It's because the benefit that can bring the UK, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, because yeah. we didn't not because we're better than the civvies, no, not cause, because we bring a different set of experience and skills and what is the best thing what is what is, how how what, how do the best teams set up they bring a broad range of people broad background broad range of skills they bring them all in and they work together that's exactly what we should be doing for the uk yeah and you know what you've touched on something else that is really interesting it's like every company that i talk to and obviously this is like actually the same i guess in the services as well it's like diversion uh, sorry better get that right <laughs> diversity and inclusion <laughs> um it's so important i mean I, I know it's very obvious right but at the end of the day um we've got a long way to go with most companies have in terms of truly representing society today um so of course there's there's a lot of work going on around gender equality which is really important but you know again and that is something that facebook's very fo- focused on um but then again you know we have differently able lgbt um veterans it's like to be truly diverse um and to have you know a real to really represent society you've got to you know you've got to work to have all of those different groups represented in the workplace and you know again that is is something that i think is going to going to take time but i think this and rightly so. The focus from so many companies now on on DNI means that you know perhaps veterans are, are now going to be, you know, considered as as a group, you know, with within um, those schemes. Therefore, hopefully, you know, there'll be more focus in time um, on on inclusion, you know, of, of, of veterans. And um, <clears throat> to your point about CTP, it's like, you know, I don't want to knock CTP because you know I've not worked with them. Um, you know, I, I talked to a lot of the CTP, some of the CTP guys for the Boost event, and they were brilliant. Um, and I know it's a tough job, and you know, most of the people I've met from the CTP are, are excellent. But I just think, you know, it, it's again they've got a job to do. The limited resources, um, you know, maybe it's time for the kind of private sector to kind of step up and say, well, you know what, like we need to do more, um, you know, to help veterans find you know, the best careers possible and, and really, you know, use their, their skills and their talent and their expertise and, um, you know, help them build. Ultimately, it's about building a fulfilling life, um, you know, after after you've served. Um, and that that's 
and I know you are as well and I you know that's that's really what my passion is now it's like that's what gets me out of bed yeah you know I, I enjoy my job but it's like what more can I do you know while I'm working at a company like Facebook to um you know to help more veterans yeah I agree I agree 100% mate we've got a few minutes left I just want to ask you briefly because I didn't know about this until yeah. the last time we spoke uh on in the um in that amazing canteen oh Facebook. in the the Facebook canteen yeah. yeah um wait can you and this is for my benefit there yeah. are my people listening because I, I don't understand it probably the Facebook workplace thing yes can you explain that to me I'm not sure I grasp but it, no, to me it's course. like a hidden forum or something can you explain yeah. Facebook workplace to me please yeah, so fa Facebook Workplace um, is is essentially an enterprise solution, a solution for companies um, who want to kind of connect their their workforce. Um, so imagine, like, if you imagine having Facebook as as a platform, having Messenger, and having essentially both those tools integrated into your enterprise. So it it becomes essentially your de facto communication um, platform for your whole company so it's literally Im imagine a private Facebook and a messenger just for your company so you get internet and you get intranet for example like yeah company intranet yeah and then you get public internet right yep. and you can set up your intranet wherever you want it yeah that's like Facebook you get Facebook public go on there and you can yeah you know um, post that your dog's died and all that and yeah. then you get Facebook basically for use by a company completely private exactly that's exactly it and what it allows you to do is so at Facebook we use workplace as our internal comms platform so um, most people are using instant messaging using messengers to talk to each other um, and then you can form any number of groups so like the Facebook vets and allies group is on workplace and then like my team we have our own group on workplace um so you know if i want to push something out to to the like the team i'll just do it on workplace um and then they all get to see it and like most of our comms um you know day to day is is all is all on workplace so actually being honest with you nobody really uses email that much now um because actually the fastest way to get a response on something is just through messenger and then you know like if you've got so if we were working on like the boost project for example we'd f we'd set up an internal group for all of the different people that are working on boost and then we can put all of the updates into the platform talk to each other post share documents you know um, keep each other updated so it's just like a really efficient way of working um it's not publicized very well <laughs> no no <laughs> i've never, never heard of it i mean the other thing i was going to say you <laughs> <laughs> is if you're like a military charity or if you're any charity we actually have again it's not very well known um we have workplace for good so essentially it's the workplace product that is available free of charge to like not-for-profit and charities if they want to use it as a as a communications platform i didn't know that i'm the chairman of a charity yeah I know that. so so it's a very you know and we actually to be honest you know we probably don't do a good enough job in in terms of oh, well, people understanding that find that message out now I'm, I'm like i'm part i'm chairman of one of the para reg association branches which are the, each one of them is a charity isn't it yeah and so we, i mean we do we do whatsapp group and then email you know? so if, but if you have like all of the para reg association like on workplace yeah you could have different groups like all under so like if you know basically the guys that are running the association wanted to push stuff out to the groups and if the groups want to have you know talk to each other or like if the group in the midlands wants to talk to like you know the colchester group or whatever you can facilitate all of that through workplace the regimental secretary listens to this podcast there you, there you go. go ray there you go ray listen to that mate he's you overseas on the chase <laughs> yeah. he's the only association is he going oh, i didn't know that you <laughs> yeah. didn't know that very awesome um but the other thing i was going to say just very quickly because I'd, I'd love when you when you talked about um like the charities and regimental associations and um you know that facebook also has um fundraising tools 
as well you know so again um maybe i can i can give you the kind of maybe give you the information to um to to find out more but um there's a lot of kind of tools that we're building now to help charities raise raise funds okay um and um yeah again that's something that isn't necessarily that well known um but at the boost event on the 22nd we're going to have an uh, an afternoon kind of work stream for military charities only um and that that'll be more about um all of the kind of fundraising tools and how to use them how to integrate them into the platform etc so we'll, we'll definitely cover that on the 22nd right so give me that again 22nd of so it will be the 22nd of october in london i think we're just finalizing the venue um but again um it'll be for all of the armed forces community um we'll be putting details out I'll probably post them on linkedin um and um with with a registration page and literally you can just go and sign up but if you're um yeah basically a veteran an entrepreneur or business owner um or a charity or not for profit um yeah we'll be doing um a lot of training sessions like hands-on training sessions how to get the best out of facebook instagram um you know how to really make the platform work for you yeah no 100 percent. I, I can vouch for it. i didn't stay for the training in the afternoon but the last event even though i was just there for the morning it was worth it just for the networking yeah I, worth yeah. it just for the networking it was absolutely absolutely brilliant um uh anything else you want to mention shamelessly plug no we just um i think that's it um you know i think the one thing that i kind of took away from that boost event um well facebook signed the armed forces covenant which you know took me a bit of time to get it over the line but we did and you know i just see that as being the foundation now for you know for for growth but i think the one thing that i took away from that event you know meeting everybody in the room was just you know this fantastic kind of unity um of you know it, it just exists you know with with veterans and you know you mentioned that they're networking and yeah i think it was a good day and there was some good training but that was the it was just seeing all of the people in the room like building these fantastic businesses and uh, you know there were lots of things like um one thing that really struck me just to finish was like all call signs you know i mean they're just doing an incredible job and like they built essentially all call signs on the facebook platforms and they're saving lives they're stopping veterans taking their own lives and that for me was just like incredible and that's just one story you know there were lots of stories in the room that day that were really inspiring and you know just made me realize how important this you know this kind of work is um so yeah it was a great event and i'm looking forward to the next one and um yeah hopefully we can get it out in the in the regions as well um at some point right mate cheers for your time really appreciate it enjoy thanks chatting. buddy really yeah. enjoyed it cool